nourisher of the earth, life-giving force without which we could not survive, rain. What is it? How and where does it begin? What is this phenomenon we call rain? From the countless surfaces of the trees and plants and the seas and oceans of our world, moisture evaporates and rises into the atmosphere. As air and water vapor rise, they cool. The cooler the air, the less moisture it can hold. Excess moisture condenses on the surfaces of microscopic airborne particles of dust, soil, and sea salt. These minute particles then become nuclei for cloud droplets which grow in size as more and more moisture condenses on them. The droplets also collide and some combine with each other. When they become too heavy to remain in the air, they fall to earth as snow or hail or rain. But there is more in our atmosphere than water vapor and particles of dust, soil, and sea salt. There are many different gases and suspended compounds whose interactions determine what is in our rain. Some of these compounds bring nourishment to our crops and forests. And some cause the rain to become acidic, or the opposite, alkaline. Among those that cause rain to become acidic are sulfur and nitrogen compounds. They come from natural sources such as soils and surface waters, volcanoes, forest fires, and lightning, and from man-made sources, from factories, furnaces, vehicles, and industrial processes. Some forms of sulfur and nitrogen can be absorbed by water droplets in the clouds. These and all other substances gathered in the raindrop combine to determine the acidity or alkalinity of the droplet and of the precipitation that reaches the earth. There is concern now that the acidity of rain may be damaging our environment. In our time, the term acid rain has become an issue of controversy and of importance. It is critical that we protect our environment. The question we must address is, how best to do this? There is first a need to sort through what we do know and to find answers to what we do not know. We need to go to the places where the answers are being sought, to the scientists who study our forests and farmlands, our lakes and our atmosphere. Without doubt, the total chemistry of rainfall is influenced by man's activities. Uh, Anyone that has seen smoke going into the air from a power plant, from a home, uh, from an automobile exhaust, realizes that material has to eventually uh, either uh, suspend in the atmosphere for a very long period of time and eventually return, or it's deposited along the sides of highways or what have you. No question about that. The serious question, though, is how much has nature been producing on her own over many, many years before uh, a man really began to influence the pollutant burden in the atmosphere? And that question, or that division between what man has contributed and what nature is contributing has never really been quantified satisfactorily to say, if I reduce man's activities by 10%, 20%, is that really going to make a material change in the chemistry of precipitation? That question is still one that needs to be resolved scientifically. We're involved in two major projects, uh, one of which is to determine what actually happens with acid rain as it passes through the forest canopy. The second of which is to determine what reaches the ground or what reaches the, the leaves and the foliage in the canopy when it's actually not raining or what we call dry deposition. In terms of the first experiment regarding the reactions in the canopy, we have found that uh, 
by monitoring rain chemistry above the canopy and at various levels within the canopy and on the forest floor below the canopy, that there's a tremendous change in chemistry as rain filters through the forest vegetation. We found that many times acid rain coming in from the atmosphere, by the time it passes through the canopy of the forest and has hit many of the leaves, is no longer acid. And that means that a lot of the acidity is being neutralized or removed somehow by the foliage in the canopy. We're interested in finding out why that happens, how it happens, and if there are any possible effects of that sort of reaction within the canopy itself. The second aspect, the uh, material that reaches the canopy, uh, acids and otherwise, does not just come, do not just come from rain. They come from uh, dry deposition when it's not raining. This involves gases, very small particles that are blown through the canopy, and larger particles that are settling onto the canopy by gravitational forces. There's a number of different methods by which we can sample this material, various samplers to absorb the gases, to collect the small particles on filters and on the leaf surface itself, and then use various chemical techniques to extract those. If we can analyze this material coming onto the canopy and make a comparison with what's actually on the leaf using electron microscopy, for example, to look at the particles, this will tell us what factors are influencing the material that comes into the canopy physically and how they might react with the incoming acid rain. Well, I think there's two major findings that we've come to in the research that have a bearing on, the, on acid rain. One of which is you cannot ignore the material coming into a forest when it's not raining. Dry deposition in many studies has been ignored in the past because it's very, very difficult to sample, very difficult to analyze. We know now that roughly half the material coming in to a system like this comes in when it's not raining. So just sampling rain causes us to miss about half the material coming into the forest. The uh, other question I think that we've been able to answer is that we have got to be able to measure the rain as it filters down through the canopy. We can't just measure rain out in the open and hope to say what possible reactions might be happening in the forest soils because the canopy has such a strong effect on removing and enhancing certain materials in the precipitation. We do need a, a considerable more amount of research before we can determine exactly what the effects are on forest nutrition, forest growth, and so on. Uh, I think several people would also admit that there's enough data in hand now to begin to look at what possible solutions uh, could be made, but we do need more research before we can implement them. Field experiments are designed to separate the effects that gaseous pollutants such as sulfur dioxide and ozone have on the growth of vegetation from the effects that acid rain may have. experimental equipment that is out there allows us to exclude ambient rainfall that's falling during a natural precipitation event and to simulate acid rainfall beneath that lid so that we can really track a natural precipitation event with the exception of modifying its chemistry. This facility allows us to take the first step in separating the gaseous pollutant effects from the acid rain effects. We are still in a relatively early stage of uh, development in, in research on the effects of acid rain on crop vegetation, for example. And we really are unable to draw uh, very many conclusive uh, statements about the effects of acid rain on vegetation at the present time. We are trying to determine the relative importance of natural sources of acidity in agricultural and forest soils and in lakes compared to sources of acidity that arise as a result of man's activities. We have not, as a scientific community, adequately investigated natural sources of acidity. So we are setting about to uh, determine the importance of soil uh, microorganisms and natural processes in soil that would lead to uh, production of acidifying components. So we have designed experiments here to look at effects on forest communities. 
We are transporting native soils from areas as far away as northern Ontario, Michigan, of course, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. And in these soils, growing forest tree species without added fertility, but with added amounts of acidified precipitation. In addition to determining the importance of natural sources, we feel it's necessary to investigate effects in terms of radial growth of forest trees as an indicator of what is taking place in unmanaged ecosystems, so to speak, compared to a, an agricultural system. I firmly believe that the answer to most of the acidity problems in lakes and those which would affect productivity of crops or forests lies underground and that there is a great matrix of variables to consider, including soil microorganisms, uh, chemicals added by way of the atmosphere, by way of man's activities in fertilizer or, um, or what have you. There are many things taking place naturally. We have not yet been able to fingerprint or identify specifically those sources that are contributing to acidity at another location. That, along with um, the many reasons for conducting research, I think have complicated the issue quite a bit. We must deal with all sources of acidity and place all in proper perspective, and we have not yet done this. The geology of the Adirondacks is quite different from one spot to the next and from one watershed to the next. A lake just over the hill is apparently unaffected, has a pH within the 6 range and does not exhibit high aluminum concentrations that are apparent in this lake. Many lakes that are very close together have very different chemical makeups. It's very difficult to assess any damage. The lake looks productive. There's a lot of algae, insects within the lake, and there are quite a number of fish within the lake. An acidic lake uh, does not necessarily mean that it, uh, it's dead. Um, many of the lakes, uh, their pH 5, which are considered acidic, uh, have quite an abundance of life. We measure a, a number of chemical constituents within the water. We are interested particularly in the pH of the water and also different metals within the water. We try to evaluate changes throughout the different seasons and throughout the different regions within the lake and we try to evaluate how this affects the biology uh, within the lake systems. It's been shown that acidic events, the snow melt in spring, can cause mortality within different populations. We know that aluminum can also adversely affect these populations within these systems. We still do not know the causes of these events. What we are trying to do is to work with biologists then and to try to determine what chemical changes are affecting the biology of these lakes. Lake acidification is one aspect of the problem. There are natural sources of acidity that may be developed in bogs, for example, or swamps. Forest cutting can deplete the soils to a certain extent and make them acid. Now, those are natural sources of acidification. In this area, we can identify waters that are naturally acidified by their chemistry. And those types of waters were recognized many years ago, and you can still see the same types of situations today. So we can segregate those out from waters we believe to be acidified by atmospheric deposition. We're studying this particular watershed in the Adirondacks because it has a very marked gradient in acidity, going from very low pHs or high levels of acidity in the headwaters of the drainage to very low acidities at the bottom of the drainage system. And this provides the fish a wide range of opportunities for habitat uh, where they can dwell depending on what their tolerances are for acidity. So we looked first at the, the distribution of fish in the watershed by sampling the streams and the lakes to see where the fish were and particularly what species were there relative to those acidity levels. And what we found so far is that the 
headwaters of the drainage basin are very strongly acidified and there are very few species of fish in that part of the system. As you go down further in the drainage basin, where the pH levels are higher and there's less acidity, we find more species of fish. Now we're experimentally trying to verify that apparent relationship between acidity and fish occurrence by actually moving the fish into different parts of the basin and measuring their survival relative to the actual existing chemistry. We're going out in the streams and sampling with electrofishing equipment to capture the, the fish because it's a very efficient way of collecting small fish in streams. It also only temporarily stuns the fish. It doesn't permanently injure them, and they recover very quickly. We're transferring some of the fish species to other sites in the basin, and then we measure their survival. We're hoping that uh, this will provide some information that will lead to a more rational basis for management. I think right now we're, we're in some sort of equilibrium situation. I don't see any trends for drastic increases in deposition or reductions for that matter. The effects that we've seen have, have probably occurred in the past and we're not seeing that much change in systems right now. So I don't expect to see any further changes in lake acidification, for example, unless there are very dramatic increases in deposition. To the extent that we've identified sources of emissions, there's an obvious solution in terms of trying to reduce emissions. But the question is, is to what extent and how much do we need to reduce emissions? And I don't think that at this point we have enough information to provide that answer. We are in the Adirondack Mountains, the land that nobody knows, but the land where most of the alleged impact of acid rain is felt. We collect clouds here, we collect precipitation in an attempt to uh, assess how much pollution-related ions arrive at this sensitive region. Being so high up in the mountains allows us to be within clouds almost half the time of the year. This obviously makes it very easy for us to catch the clouds and measure the pH of the cloud, the chemical composition, the sulfate, the nitrate, and a variety of other substances. This will then help us to establish eventually a source receptor relationship between the gases in the atmosphere and precipitation quality that the soil eventually will receive. I think our ultimate goal is understanding where the precipitation quality comes from that we measure here, uh, what happens to it on its way from sources to its ultimate sink, which is this mountain here, or the Adirondack at large, and to eventually come forward with a relationship that links sources somewhere in this country with the receptor area such as Whiteface Mountain. The high peaks and the Adirondacks in general are made of solid rock. This here is granite that uh, has aged over the past two and a half billion years. There is no way that this bedrock will neutralize the acidity that falls from the sky. So obviously it's not hard to understand that whatever acidity comes from the sky will run off in the water and will be found in the watershed. The soil that you see here is very thin. It is a very harsh climate. So if anywhere in the country do you feel the impact of acid depositions, it would be in areas such as this, where the soil, the underlying bedrock, is very sensitive to acidic inputs, where vegetation is at the verge of breaking down. This is environmental stress, as an ecologist would define it, as its best we find that the uh, sulfate and nitrate levels in precipitation and in clouds are almost half as much as we find in the middle of industrialized regions. So obviously, this area is impacted, and our job is to find out where it comes from. It's very difficult to uh, find sources, individual sources. It's very difficult from this remote place to imagine that some regions far away, hundreds of miles away, can have a profound impact. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we do feel here that whatever we measure 
within this region, most of it has been transported into this region. The Adirondacks uh, do not have uh, great emission sources, so sulfur and nitrogen compounds must come from somewhere. Do they come from sources 100 miles away, 500 miles away, 1,000 miles away? Do they come from the southwest or from the northwest? This is still subject to heated debate. We are equipped to measure how much arrives. We are equipped to find out from what direction they came from. But at this moment, we are not yet equipped to find out where they have originated. This would be research whereby somewhere in the country, very specific tracers are released. So specific that if we catch them up here, we know where they came from. And with that information, we are a giant step closer to the source receptor relationship. Over the past 20 years that we studied the mountain, the clouds and the precipitation, we have not observed an increase in precipitation acidity. We have not observed an increase in sulfate levels in the clouds. To the contrary, all indications that we have are such that this general region here has experienced an improvement in the sulfate exposure. Uh, 25 years ago, sulfate in precipitation and sulfate in the air was higher than it is today. Even though the atmospheric input seems to have improved, it wasn't enough for the sensitive ecosystem in the Adirondack to appreciate that improvement in atmospheric deposition. At this time, uh, we don't have a clear indication that acid rain is the single culprit. There are other factors that can contribute. For example, a drought can uh, initiate a change in the uh, soil and subsequently a change in the vegetation. I guess what makes us so concerned is that the changes in the vegetation that we see in the Adirondacks occur very slowly, very, very slowly, over a period of 10 to 20 years. These are not the changes where you would walk in today, look at a tree, and then come back a year later and say, here, see a damage. That at the same time makes it obviously so hard to focus on as far as our efforts are concerned to see whether the atmosphere, the soil, or a combination of everything caused the change that one observes. Sitting up here on top of Whiteface Mountain and watching the world, uh, one certainly would like to see the air cleaned up. The options to do so, however, without compelling reasons from the point of view that there's a health hazard or an imminent ecolo ecological damage, uh, those uh, should come uh, from not only environmental concerns but also from economic concerns. We just cannot uh, go out uh, without substantial proof and request an uh, improvement in the atmosphere uh, because there is suspicion that this atmospheric composition does harm. We must have a bit better understanding. We must have a better understanding of source receptor relationships. So in lack of that better understanding, one should look for solutions that are not only environmentally desirable, but uh, that are also economically desirable. For all of us, our environment lies at the very heart of the quality of our lives. The need to protect it is beyond argument or debate. The question that remains is, how best to do this? There are options. We can treat our lakes to lessen their acidity. And we can restore fish populations. We can clean the fuel we burn. But whatever we choose to do, whatever road we take, 
we must be certain of the benefits we will receive. We need to increase our knowledge so that our actions will be environmentally responsible, cost-effective, and will achieve the results that we want, solutions that will work. We should act wisely and with careful consideration on behalf of our environment. Through a program of continuing and committed research on acid rain, through intelligent and meaningful action, our nation's scientists, working with government and industry, are providing the knowledge necessary for workable solutions.